Um, it's All so right. funny. I, the first thing I've, I've always wanted. One of the f- most fascinating things is how you, you I, you've talked about your sobriety before, sure. And it's, but it's you're one of those people where you're so on it, like you're so good, you're so funny, you're so successful that I go, how was he ever a fuck up? Like how was he ever? <laughs> yeah, I can't just, see it, you know. Yeah, you know, I I think that. Is that a real, is that a cat or an owl? I, that where? Oh, it's a plastic owl. A plastic owl, yeah. plastic owl. By the way, I just bought owl boxes for my new house oh, yeah? so that I can have owls come out and nest. Well, you be careful with your owls around uh, your chickens. No, no, owls protect chickens. Oh, do they? Yeah, are they, are I don't they know. I haven't, Googled, I haven't Googled that. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, here's the thing. I, uh, I, I certainly was a fuck up, uh, but... I don't have any. Um, I don't have any in evangelical uh, impulses about sobriety, and I think that's what you pick up on. If you want to get fucked up, you get fucked up. I yeah. I really don't. You know. Yeah. I really don't have a tambourine to to do. You know to to play here, but I. Uh, you know, I, the only deal I made when I got sober was if anybody wanted me to help them. I'd help them. That was the deal, you know. And so, if anybody ever puts their hand out to me, and if it's within my power to help them get sober, I'll help them get sober. But I'm not going to chase people around begging them to get sober or advocate temperance or anything like that. I don't. I, I don't. If I could drink, I would. If I could take heroin, I would. Uh, really? But unfortunately, I can't. Sweet. Did you ever do heroin? Oh yeah, yeah, a few times. Um, I actually think that the the new stuff the uh oxycontins and stuff like that people are taking now fentanyl yeah fentanyl i've never had but i had a piece of dental work done a couple of years ago and they gave me a percocet because it was very uh it was v- intense pain and i resisted it and resisted it and resisted it and eventually the pain got so much under the guidance of you know like fucking you know people coming around and we you know observe me hey sweetie oh i guess he didn't uh, put her back up uh all right Is that's he- the pup yeah I like that she's wearing a T-shirt. Oh, she just had surgery. Oh. Yeah, so yeah. she's got stitches she can't yeah. go after. So well, we, at least it's not the collar. Uh, that, that, the collar's ridiculous, and she, yeah. it was, she was knocking over so much stuff in the house yeah. that we couldn't. No, you I, can't do that. Yeah. Just get up here and relax. Okay? All right. So, so, wait, so, you, you so, know, I, so I took the, this Percocet, which I, you know, under you know, strict supervision, but I took it. And, and I have to say that, first of all, the... The sensation, what it did was it took the pain away. It's what I needed to do. I was in agony. In, in that much severe pain, it does sincerely just take oh, the pain away. Oh, it just took, it takes the pain away. And, and, I, and I, I, I just couldn't bear it anymore. But what it also did when it took the pain away, you know, I don't know if, if this would have done it had I not taken heroin, but, but it felt so good. Really? Yeah, I didn't feel high. I didn't feel high at all, actually. But what I felt was, I felt that everything was going to be all right. I just, everything was going to be fine. No, I didn't feel high with that. I just felt great. I just felt fucking great. I didn't want to drink or get fucked up or anything. I just wanted to, I didn't want anything. I was fine. Yeah. And I thought, whoa, this new synthetic heroin is much better than the old <laughs> shit. <laughs> There's no throwing up. There's no no fucking guys coming around to your house with guns or anything. You just fucking, you just take it and everything feels all right. I'm like, wow. So I can see why people have a problem. I mean, I genuinely can. I mean, I, I took it under such strict supervision. So wait, how does that start? Did you call like a... Like a, a sponsor or someone? Yeah, yeah, and all of that. And, you know, and, and so and everybody's like, no, it's okay. And my wife had the the thing, the Percocet. She gives it to her. I mean, like, I, I just put so many checks and balances in front of yeah. me fucking up along that line. I've seen a lot of people with long-time sobriety fuck their lives up with that stuff. 
you know, really? with, with prescription meds. So I, I was very, very cautious about it. But like I said, it was an intense piece of dental surgery. It was a lot and it was infected and it was like, and I'm like you know, it was just, it was too much. Because I said to the dentist originally, look, I'm not going to take this. And he went, I think you will. Uh, I, think, I, I, think I fell you know. off a waterfall one time and uh, the lady, and I was immobile. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't, I think that's the right word. I couldn't move. I couldn't, yeah, that's the right I word, couldn't right? do anything. I, it was, I've never been in uh, that much pain in my entire life. It shot down to my legs um, and, uh, and it was, I thought I broke my back. Yeah. And we go into the hospital and the lady says to me, I'm going to give you Dilaudid. I know what Dilaudid is. It's that's a, it's a heroin it's, type it's, thing. It's, a, it's yeah. derivative of heroin. Yeah. heroin. I said to her, you know what? I'd rather not. I said, you know, I, I know myself very well. I've never experienced that, but I don't want to know what that feels like Yeah, because I don't want to open that door because I may not be able to get back. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much the conversation I had. Yeah, and she said to me, honey, you do not you you're going to get take this yeah she goes i need to x-ray your back and in order to do that i need to move you around and yeah. i can't move you around right now she's like you're getting it so i turned my phone on i recorded it, and i said well if i'm gonna try heroin for the first time i'm writing a poem when it hits nice and so i turned my phone on <laughs> all i can say was oh fuck oh fuck <laughs> so it really was heroin it was like yeah. i was like yeah it's and, funny though because i i i really you know I've had friends die of heroin overdoses, you know. In fact, the first friend of mine that died of any kind of uh, illness like that was a 21-year-old kid in in, uh, in New York. And, you know, he was there one day and he was gone the next. You don't fucking think of that when you're 21, you know. It's yeah. like, it's not possible. It happens to fucking celebrities and shit, but it doesn't happen to, to us. It doesn't happen to real real life people. Yeah. But he was there and he was a guy that I worked in construction with. And he was there and then he just fucking copped one night and that was it. And I was like, "What the fuck?" Um, and uh, but I can I can see it, you know. I I it was like we were talking earlier. I I never really was that interested in weed, because it seemed so inefficient as a drug. Yeah. You know, I liked drugs to do their job, but not fucking tickle me. Yeah. You know, just get the fucking job done. So if I can't, the, if, wow, the personality that hits weed and goes, "This is it." Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Also, it kind of it made weed made me anxious. Yeah, it makes me anxious. Yeah, I made made me anxious and, and uncomfortable. As I much know. marijuana as I I did just have in here, and yeah, and I, I, I yeah, to, you get it because even being around it makes me anxious, which is weird. The smell of it, I'm like, Bleh. I can feel it right now. I'm like, no, Bleh. it's. I think it gives you. I think it. I think there is a Pavlovian sensation mm -hmm. with it, where your brain goes like, I used to. I'm being dead serious. I used to not be around people smoke. I couldn't be around people when they smoked weed. Cause I get anxious. The smell of it would make me I, anxious. I'm like that. Yeah, around, and, I'm like that around weed. I'm um I'm not around like that around coke. Cause I'm not really around anyone who does coke. Yeah. I mean, not that I know of. And if and if I don't know they're doing coke, then they're not doing enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and I'm not really around that. But if if there were lines of coke laid out in the table, there that wouldn't make me anxious. I'd be like, the fuck are you doing, Barry? Yeah. But. But weed around, I'm like, I fucking feel like it'll creep up and like steal something from me. You know yeah. what I mean? It's, it's weird. I never, I swear to God, I've never smelt it until we removed it and I walked back in and I went, God damn it, this does Yeah, smell like well, weed. I think it's a hot day. The doors were closed. There yeah. was weed in here. Yeah. It started to work. It's what, um, what about alcohol? Like, how, what's off the, off, <laughs> off the charts for me, I'm afraid. Really? But I, I mean, I stopped drinking alcohol. Well, we've talked about this a long time ago, yeah. uh, 1992. And that's yeah, when I started. Was that? That's when, when you started? started? You've been not drinking as long as I have been. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's okay. You know, it's all right. It's not a competition. <laughs> no. um, I, um, alcohol for me, it wasn't. It wasn't that I that I particularly I felt like I, I didn't have much trouble stopping drinking for a couple of days, but after a couple of days, I, I you know I'd get well actually I, I'm probably overestimating. After about a day, I would get uncomfortable, and really I think what understanding my own alcoholism, if if I do, it it was more about. Um, how discomfort how much discomfort i felt when i wasn't drinking you know what i mean 
I had to change the me. I, I had to change that person. The person who was drinking, truth is, when I was drinking, I wasn't really a tough drunk or even a very interesting one. You know, I'd have a laugh and fall asleep, maybe throw up. Nothing nothing flamboyant, you know. I'm like, yeah. I, I wasn't on fucking trains in Russia making friends with, <laughs> you know, the fucking, the KGB and shit. I was like, I, I occasionally had things like that, but it yeah. wasn't, wasn't, I wasn't really a particularly exciting drunk. I just was a fucking miserable sober person. And so I think that's what I had to do was get away from from that to get away from how uncomfortable I felt when I wasn't drinking. So how did you do that? So like, so you, you quit drinking in 92. Oh, there's so much I want to know, but I want I kind of want to know your path to the States. Okay. Um, well, it's a, like everything in my life, it's not a straight line. No. Yeah, because you're talking about working construction in New York, and I'm going, what? Like yeah, 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 yeah. Well, what happened was, uh, I, came, I first came to America when I was 13. I came for a vacation with my dad. Uh, my dad and I got a cheap flight from Scotland to visit my Uncle James and my Aunt Susan, who live in, uh, in America, in, in Long Island. And uh, we went to go and visit them, and I was here for three weeks, and then I came back. Uh, or I went back to Scotland. Then when I was 21, I came back here again. I went to New York and I had a, a informal immigration uh, status at the time. So I was working, there was a certain kind of mafia of Irish and Scottish guys in New York that could set you up, you know, particularly Irish guys, if I'm honest, uh, set you up in various uh, construction enterprises. Nothing illegal per se, but you know, it's just like working on a construction site. And uh, and I did that for a year and then I went back to Scotland. And I continued to drink and do drugs right up until I was 29, 1992. Uh, and then in 1992, I got sober and I was sober for a couple of years and I thought, I really want to have a crack at America. And I'd been sober for a couple of years. So I came back here uh, when I was 32 years old, it was 1995. I uh, just, uh, I was almost 33 and I, um, and then I started working here. So I was uh, kind of like backwards and forwards a little bit. Really? Mm. And so wait, you, how did then, so you, at 30, 30 years old, you got sober? Yeah, almost. Yeah. So how, what was the path to being comfortable in your own skin? You know, it's not, uh, Cause it's not, uh I, I can identify with that a tad bit. Like there is a part of me, like, it sounds silly, but like. I quit drinking every October for a month. Hmm. We do that sober October thing. Yeah, yeah. And um, and there is a f the first couple of days where I'm like, I can feel on edge, and then, and then I'm fine. I, I don't notice it. I don't really notice it gone. I actually enjoy. I this sounds stupid to say out loud, but I enjoy life a little bit better without drinking. I'm a lot ha happier, but I find that I don't. I don't really want to go out and see people. I don't. I'd like to be home. I'd like to get my work done come home and turn on the tv put on pajamas and oh, that's you're describing my life that's what i do yeah like and so but it, it comes at conflict with my my life is that i i'm a social person i do have to go to comedy clubs like well, okay. i go to i go on tour and i would go on tour and i get done and i'd be like i'd be like i, I think i'm gonna i mean i'd go to bars sometime and hang out with people for the most part i was like i really am excited to get in back into the tour bus and put on netflix and go to sleep or may you know i think you know it's very hard to the it's very hard to, to define alcoholism i i think you have to i think people have to define it for themselves in an odd way yeah. i know plenty of people look i'm from scotland i know plenty of people that drink too much yeah it doesn't mean they're fucking alcoholics yeah it just means they drink too much it's different alcoholism i think is a little different you can drink too much and ruin your fucking life that's fine you know you can you know early old age fuck up your internal organs you know drive a car into the wrong place do something insane make a stupid decision when you're drunk all of that's available without being an alcoholic yeah but what alcoholism did for me is that when i took the first drink of alcohol i could not guarantee where the world was going for me after that point i take the first drink and this is what I believe makes me an alcoholic. It sets up in me a physical, a physical reaction, which I don't fully understand to this point. But it sets up in me a reaction where I start thinking differently about who I am. So I'll take a drink 
And then, because I used to think the phenomenon of craving alcohol was alcoholics take a drink and they go, oh, i got to keep drinking, i got to keep drinking. Ah, yeah, I'm yeah, so crazy. Yeah. And, you know, you run into churches and drink the communion wine. And certainly those people exist. But I wasn't like that. What I would do is I would say, I, I'll, you know, I haven't had a drink for a couple of days. Everyone lighten the fuck up. I'd take a drink, right? Then I'd take a drink and go, eh, I'm good. And I'd be good for a couple of hours or maybe even a day. And then I'd be like, yeah, I'll have another one. That other one was fine. And so the the the, the level of self-deception that occurs within me is triggered by the first drink. Yeah. So I and I think that is one of the things that makes me certainly the defining uh principle of my alcoholism is that I believe it is the first drink that gets me drunk. Not the third or the fourth or the 15th, but the first one. The first one changes my mind sufficiently that I am no longer in charge. You know, I am no longer in charge of my thinking. So funny because I only, my perception of you is, my perception of you, I, I would argue, is inspiring. Because, and I say this to anyone listening that might be dealing with this, is that I only know you as an in charge fun hilarious human being like mm -hmm. i don't i can't imagine the side of you i i can't see a side of you that isn't you know and i it's maybe it's hard sometimes with like i don't, I don't know how long i've known of you i i mean I, I'm, I'm guessing since i probably you've been working on television for i'm guessing 20 years yeah easy yeah, yeah. and so yeah. i've known of you for 20 years yeah as like a celebrity and so everything works for you to think that there was another person is almost so hard for me to wrap my head around well the, the, first of all just because i'm sober doesn't mean everything works for me it doesn't your house is inspiring yeah i when i went to your house <laughs> when i went to your house i saw a different side of life where i thought <laughs> i thought this is the the, the temperature around your house war warmed and cozied i love your house so much well, that I thought I thought and there was like authenticity to it I, I remember seeing like a, a like a little kid jeep or something out in the front and going like this is what li and then you go back to your little where you're doing the podcast and I was like fuck yeah I mean it was like one of those times where you're like this is what direction I want to go in this is how I see it so to see that to hear about the guy that that you know is inside you that where you line it up going I'm going to take an oxycotton Oh, I need help. Yeah, listen. The, I don't want you giving you the impression that I got my shit sorted out. I don't. What you have I, it so what, much better than so anyone else, though. <laughs> yeah, I, listen. I have it. It's better than it used to be. But I don't want to give you the idea that nothing challenging happens to me, or I don't. You know, it, it, look, I, what I did learn pretty early on is they they can't lock you up for what you're thinking. I still have a lot of crazy fucking thoughts. It's just I, I think I've managed to find a way to make many of them marketable as opposed to, <laughs> yeah. fucking, you know, arrestable. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I think that my thought processes have, I, they've changed over the years I've been sober. But, you know, I didn't do it alone. I, look, there are traditions wrapped up in how I stay sober, so I can't really talk about how it, it was done with complete openness to yeah. you, but you can figure it out, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, and that that's really the only way I found possible was to create uh, a psychic change in myself that was brought about in no small part, really, to, uh, well, in fact, totally uh, done by other people for me, really. I just asked them for help. So when, how old were you when you started working on Drew Carey? Um, see, I was, I got here in 95. I started in that in 96. So I was 34. So how was that? How, okay. Tell me how quick well, the story, that, that leap is so quick. It, it was an odd story, actually. What happened was. Had you done stand-up in Scotland before Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd been doing stand-up. When, well, what happened was when I was in, uh, when punk rock happened, I was uh, in my early teens. And so. When, how fucking lucky are you? Today? I know. See, that's I mean, really that's what it is. So, that's what I'm it was. A huge fan, I, and I don't like saying it out loud because I know that it, it's it's in in our country. It's almost like the things to say. You're punk rock, or to say I was obsessed with punk rock. 
from my freshman year in high school is when I was introduced to it. And my, uh, I got a, I got a, the kid that drove me to school was a senior, Sam Solario. And he was, first thing he put in was Susie and the Banshees. And I was like, what the fuck is this? And he's like, oh, you never heard of this? And then, and then next thing he was like, well, he's like, well, we should start at the Sex Pistols. So we put the Sex Pistols in. And I was, I mean, I remember that night listening. I was in, uh, this sounds really weird, but I was in a bath. I used to take, I like, I still like baths. I was in a bath, yeah, bath listening to the Sex Pistols and going like, this is like, this is changing the way I think. And then I spiraled out all through high school. I was obsessed. But you got to experience punk rock. You got to experience it. As it, it arrived, yeah. As it showed up. Yeah, it was very, you got to remember, it was, a very, it was an odd time in Britain. There was a massive economic downturn in the 19, when I was in my mid-teens and, uh, and all the bands, the music that the, that we were as kids asked to like, were playing in fucking stadiums and flying around in, in their own planes and and all that stuff. And and what punk rock was and what it felt like was that these were people that we were our age and had no fucking money and no hope either. And so there was a real connection there. But also, it was about fashion, and people forget that I mean, punk rock was started really by two fashion. Uh, icons. It was Vivian Westwood, Malcolm McLaren. Malcolm really. McLaren had the shop. Right. Well, it was Vivian Westwood was the designer in the shop. Viv it was Vivian was was the was the was the 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 visual genius behind punk rock, and and still is, and but still thinks in that way. You know, I think not enough is made of what Vivian Westwood did at that time, and she would be very dismissive of me saying this, I'm sure. But but I really think so. I really think that her. Um, wonderful uh, artistic uh, vision uh, created a, a great deal. The music as well, of course. But but, but well, you're more. right. I I the first time I ever ever saw anything punk rock, mm. it was the haircut. I remember driving to school in like fifth grade. Yeah, and you I saw a kid with like a, a mohawk. Yeah, and mohawks I, came in a bit later. Actually, I mean the the mohawk thing I don't remember right at the start. It was. Like I became aware of punk rock happening around about 76, 75, 76, I think. Yeah. Um and and um but what it did was what what happened at that time, because I was a teenager, is that every kid wanted to be in a punk rock band. So being in a band when I was a teenager is like the way people have Twitter accounts now. Like, why wouldn't you be in a band? Yeah. Like it was your social media was the band that you were in that was what you did everybody was in a fucking band so that pulled me into a world of performing that from where i'm from that would never have happened i would i don't come from fucking circus folk or performing people i'm from yeah. you know i'm from postmen and engineers you know so the what was that it's my my wife just got home I said, oh, she right. opened the garage your wife is the god of thunder <laughs> <laughs> um, but the uh, uh, it pulled me into a world of performance, and and once I was in bands, because I was a pretty good drummer, I go into better bands than I would have normally, and because I was in better bands, I started to meet artistic people, like like real artistic people who were like really musicians and and really in into theater and movies and 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 stuff, and so there was no co stand up comedy in Scotland. There was Billy Connolly, and that was it. Yeah. But what and the, he started, he started through music. He, right? he was a folk musician. Yeah. He would just talk between the songs. But Billy had become, uh, he was the only one I was aware of that people like me, you know, that had done anything like that. But if you were funny and if, if you were crazy, and I was crazy then, uh, they would say things like, go up and talk for 10 minutes while we change out the drum kit and stuff like that. You know, the coveted talking between the fucking band's equipment gig. I've been paid to do that. Oh, fuck, yeah, me too. <laughs> but but that's, I kind of get drawn into that. And that's what led me into it. So really, really the only reason I came into any form of entertainment is is punk rock. That, that's what drew me in. If I, if I had, if that hadn't happened, I'd be a, you know, a, I don't know, a guy working in a, Probably getting ready to retire for some fucking job. <laughs> yeah. no, that's, not, that's not too bad. So then you started in started doing stand up that way, and then throughout Scotland, 
Yeah. What I did was I, I, I did it. I had the, because you know, when you start out, you always have all the things to protect you. Yeah. So, you know, a lot yeah. of people have the guitar or the, the hat with the hammer and the hand. Take their shirt off. Yeah, yeah whatever. Well, take your shirt off. <laughs> so, but everyone's got the little gimmick when they start yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. I did a character yeah. called, uh, it was a kind of like a, a very local kind of joke. Uh, and it was a really Scottish guy, a really with a really parochial accent, even for Scottish people. And his name, he would talk about all the things that he hated. And he talked like that. He was like, talk like a Scottish guy, but from outside of the city, so people would laugh at him, Ken. <laughs> and so he talked like that. And his name the, of this character was Bing Hitler. Bing as in Crosby, Hitler as in the Third Reich. And what the, what the name did is it got some marquee value because people were like, what the fuck's this? <laughs> but I never did anything in the act that was anything remotely connected to, you know, singing or you know, fascism. Yeah. That was just the guy's name. Yeah. And then he would just talk about different things. And that seemed to catch fire uh, in Scotland. It did catch fire in Scotland. It was very, very popular. And I was, I was paying, you know, 2,000, 3,000 seat venues when I was 24 years old, but only in Glasgow or Edinburgh or Aberdeen, you know, so yeah. like in this tiny area. But these decent sized venues, I would happily play now, you know, and the uh, so it, there was a flush of that. And then I was still drinking. So I, you know, I fucked it up, you yeah. know, or did I? I stopped doing it, uh, which is probably a good thing because yeah. you don't want to stay the local comic. Yeah. So. Um, so that kind of led me into it. But it started off with the punk rock and that character and that character took off. And that's what led me in. And that and so when by the time you moved to the states, quit drinking. Yeah. Are you doing stand up in the states? No, I I when I came out here, I wanted to I wanted to make films. I didn't want to do stand up, and so I nobody wanted to make any films with me. So I auditioned for different TV shows. I eventually got the Drew Carey show, and and I made. The Drew Carey show, and then I made some films. I made, you know, a couple of films that I liked, and uh, and then, you know, I I kind of it was going okay. And then I got divorced. I made a movie which failed, which I'd never have happened before. Like failed. Yeah. Um, and uh, and my first kid was born, and this all happened in a eighteen month period. And I needed a job. Because now I'm divorced, I'm, I need a job where I'm in town. So I love my boy. I, I got to be in town. I need, so I can't be going to, you know, Russia for six weeks to make a film about you know, Carl Jung. I, I, I'd like to, but I can't. Yeah. So, funnily enough, I did go and do that. But, um, but eventually, I, I kind of like, uh, I got, Craig Kilborn had quit late night. I'd been on the Drew Carey show. Drew Carey show had ended. They died a natural death, as these things do. Craig Kilborn had quit late night, and they were trying out different people on the late night show. And they, I had been a guest on that show, and they thought that I was a worthwhile candidate to try out. And I went through the audition process that they had set up to do that show, and, and I got it. And, that, and that's what led me into it. So once I started doing that show, and I felt the... I was very lucky when I did that show because I'll get to the point of doing stand up in America because what it what it was was in a roundabout way this is what happened or in an exact way really when Johnny Carson quit the Tonight Show CBS NBC are fighting Letterman Leno with that war and CBS are so desperate to get Letterman that they offer him two hours of real estate he owns the time period between 11.30 and 1.30. He doesn't just do a show. He owns that period of time for as long as he's on the air. So that creates a buffer. So by the time that I go in to do the show after Dave, CBS and me are not a normal marriage. That wouldn't work. That would never work. But I wasn't really working for CBS. I had fucking David Lerman. So Dave, as long as Dave wasn't mad at me, I was all right. And Dave's too busy doing his show yeah. to really worry about what I'm doing. So I just get on with doing my show. CBS, the, the bad thing was CBS never promoted the show and never gave a fuck about it because they didn't own it. It wasn't theirs. It was Dave's. So there was no really? fucking posters or no, like I went to an award ceremony once when I was working on the late night show 
up at the Banff Comedy Festival in Canada, yeah. were giving me the Lifetime Achievement Award, right? For comedy. It's a big, the Peter used to know of award. It's a big fucking award. Not physically, it's actually about that size, but they're Canadian. Yeah. So I go up there and I'm getting this award. It's a big fucking, everyone in TV is at this fucking place in Banff. And CBS have a reel that they play into the studio uh, to, the, to the guests of all the different CBS shows, you know, the guys solving crimes and, you know, psychic doctors and all what other fucking bullshit they've got on. And, and then it goes, another late night guy. And they've got this fucking five minute tribute to Dave. I'm not on the reel. They, they did not put me on the fucking reel. I'm there getting the biggest award at the fucking festival and they didn't put me on the reel because they fucking didn't own the show. They didn't give a fuck about me, which was bad in one way, but great in another way because I could get on with my dancing horse and my robot skeleton. Yeah, you, uh, that was, you, your show had such a different vibe than other shows. Yeah, and it'll never happen again. Oh, That'll no. never happen again because Dave's gone and that system, it was just that it was a look in history that, that so happened. wait how did you get how 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 did you did you audition for for i would Worldwide on, pants? what happened is the decision to give me the job was taken between david letterman peter lasalle who was my producer on that show mm -hmm. peter was johnny carson's producer for 30 years He's a legend in that world a, a genius in that world and he taught me how to do the job peter lasalle david letterman rob burnett who uh, yep. runs worldwide pants or did it was uh, dave's guy uh or ceo there so <laughs> these guys decided uh on my fate and they gave me the job what was a more fun show that show or drew carey oh the late night show really oh yeah. what was the drew carey show experience like it this, was fine it was great but i was a banana just, you know it's, I but, it's, yeah, but it's sitcom it's like sitcom when sitcoms counted like yeah. you got you got to do two of the biggest formats when they mattered. Yeah. Have you noticed that both of these formats have died since I left them? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's all I'm saying. I, I that's all noticed. I'm saying. I mean, Drew the Drew Carey show. I mean, one of the one of the quintessential sitcoms, but with with a cast of fucking bangers. Mm. Like, mm. I mean, to this day, I DJ Ryan, Bader, Ryan Styles, Ryan Styles, Drew, Kathy Kenny. I mean, these are heavy fucking hitters. I mean, they were great. I mean, what you guys started doing, didn't you guys start doing shows where you were like, no script? And yeah, the just, improv and, shows? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was very uncomfortable with that. Really? Yeah, weirdly enough, I never, I never felt comfortable in those improv shows. I didn't like them. Because they were actually, it was quite tightly controlled improv, which I didn't like. Yeah. So they would say, and it was games. Yeah, yeah, you know, it was improv. Change. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Change. New hat, new hat. New you know, hat. Different voice, different voice. And I'm like, whoa, fucking gang, stop <laughs> saying things to me. So it, it didn't, I wasn't confident or or uh, I didn't shine in that environment. Um, but in late night, it was just me in the dark, man. It was I, me I and my you, people. I think you could have done the show without guests. I wanted to. I think you, I think, I, I, I think a lot of times I'd be like, I watch it and I go, get this guy off. Let's just go back to the. <laughs> well, there's a lot of times I was interviewing people. I was like, let's get this guy off. Give me the horseback. But the the thing is about about doing a show like that is the you know I I feel very lucky. I'm very proud of that show, and I'm very I feel very lucky that I got the chance to do it. It really was a fluke. It really was a fluke because it was so such a weird confluence of events how did it how did it line up like did were there a bunch of people testing for it oh yeah yeah there was a uh, there was a lot of people wanted the gig yeah um who else what other names were on the list do you I, remember i i remember that go, the four it got down to was me michael ian black who's a very funny guy yeah uh dl hughley who's a fucking comic genius yeah and uh and a kid called damien fahey who was too young then but actually has turned into a really funny, talented guy, you know, really. So, so these were, it go down to four guys. Um, and I got it, which is amazing. What, what was it like? What was it like the first time you realized you were rich? I don't know if I, if I can really say with all honesty that I feel that, you know, I know I've got a little money. But I do know 
Well, you know, because I'm I'm not from my I'm from no man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, so, so I think that kind of stays with you. You think it's all going to go away? My point. wife, my yeah. wife grew up poor, and she'll never. She's, it's poor is I I think like poor is something that's stuck in your DNA. Yeah, a little bit. You know, so it kind of feels like it kind of feels like that a little bit. Um, I do know this. I I got it was one day you you're a dog guy, right? So yeah. you know this. So I, I used to have the since you know dogs come and go and that's the way of things. So this is a long time ago. I had a dog and uh, she had a terrible ass dis- gastrointestinal disease thing I had to deal with. So part of the treatment was I had, she had these little maggot things coming out of her ring piece and I had to like go in there and take those little maggots out of her ass. There's the dog shit and the maggot. I, she was a lovely animal, but it just, yeah. you know, I, I had to, you got to do things sometimes when you get dog. So I'm taking a maggot out of this dog's ass and the phone goes and I picked up the phone. And it was my business manager, and he said, "Good news, you're technically a millionaire." <laughs> like taking maggots out of a dog's ass. I thought, "Yeah, uh, I guess this is what being rich feels like." <laughs> it you're doesn't. Technically it a doesn't. Millionaire. You know, I, like a lot of people, like a lot of people still do. I believed money would solve a lot of problems that it can't even touch. You know, yeah. can't fucking touch it. But it takes away money problems, and if you've got money problems, if you've had money problems, and I've certainly had that. Then it, it 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 takes them away, but it doesn't take the fear away. The fear, the fear of being poor, the fear of financial insecurity. You got to deal with that in a different way. You can't deal with that with money. That's a spiritual problem. Yeah, I I, I didn't grow up. I mean, I didn't grow up rich, but I didn't grow up poor. Right. I grew up. My dad was a lawyer, so we had like I. You had money. We had money. I I, I would never say was funny. he a, a bus stop bench uh, advertisement no. lawyer or higher up Boston legal? No, no, no. Uh, he was. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying, telling uh, someone about this today. We lived in like a poor neighborhood, and he was like, uh, he that's when he was like a bus stop bench lawyer, right? Uh, and then he got a big, really big client, right? Uh, the Church of Scientology. Okay. And and that's a big client. Yeah, he beat, I feel like it might come with strings though. He beat they saw I mean I'm I don't think my dad's comfortable with this, but he beat, someone tried to escape the church and the church had actually I think kidnapped that person. By the way, speculative. I was a child when the story was told. So mm-hmm. statue of limitations. I don't want the, yeah, yeah. The church tried to kidnap him and my dad that guy sued the church and the and my dad won. And so as soon as he won the Church of Scientology came into my dad's office. And they're like, anyone that can beat us, we want to hire. So they hired my dad on retainer, and it was like good money. And my so we built a big house, uh, you know, in a nice neighborhood, and and then the church fired him, like let him go and didn't pay him. No, so I mean, worse than fucking being poor, being rich, then being poor again. Yeah, and so we I lived in. I was just telling this literally an hour ago. We lived in this big house that had no furniture, and so. So we weren't rich, but we did have a big house. But but right. they, they were like, we only had like our bedrooms had furniture, and our and our one room and downstairs had furniture. And where where was this? Tampa. All right, so you don't need to pay for heating. No, no, okay, no. So Air conditioning, okay. no. Air conditioning, so, yeah. But um, but I but I was blessed enough to grow up, not caring about money. Like didn't I didn't like it didn't I, come in your thought never person. and never once no, registered. I don't, th- I don't think it really came in and my i didn't know we were i didn't know we were poor yeah and no one had brought it up to me when i was a kid i never felt like we lacked for anything it was only later on i went oh god i think we must have been poor you know my dad i look back now now that i now that i am where i am and i know that i've never had the conversations or i've never raised my voice regarding money and my dad definitely did that my dad would definitely had definitely yelled at me a number of times for me not knowing but I think my dad grew up poor, so he was always afraid of money. Always- yeah, I think once you get that fear of money, it's very hard to shake. Um, my wife's got it bad. Yeah, I, I, you know, I still have it. I'm sure yeah. I'm frightened of I'm frightened of losing money and being irresponsible with it and stuff. Yeah. Um, although the truth is, um, I'm not as frightened of it as my business manager. He he's very frightened of me being irresponsible with money, and that's really? why I've been with the same guy for 25 years. Because <laughs> you know he's like, no, Craig, no, I don't think so. <laughs> you got to sell that. I'm like, well, really? Went, oh yeah. I'm like, okay. 
have you thought about moving out of California? I have moved out of California. Oh, you're in you're in Scotland now. Yeah, yeah. you're in Scotland full time. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, for now, which is weird because I'm an American who lives abroad in the country that I'm from. <laughs> Shut up! Isn't that weird? If you're like me, you've got lots of stuff, lots and lots of stuff, stuff you no longer use or maybe even never use, stuff that doesn't spark joy in your life. Now that the New Year's here. It's time to finally deal with all that stuff. And I'm not talking about hiding in the closet. I'm talking about selling it on Macari. You know Macari, the selling app. The selling app that makes selling almost anything fast and easy. So here's where you begin. Go through your home and find all the stuff you didn't use in 2019. That phone in the drawer, the pair of jeans you only wore once, the handbag hiding in the back of your closet. Listing it takes just minutes. You take a few pics, add a description, and... Boom, your item's connected to millions of buyers on the app. Macari will even email you a shipping label when it sells. Everything ships, so there's no awkward meetup with strangers, which is great now that it's dark at night. The app has over 500,000 reviews on the App Store with an average rating of 4.8, so why not give it a try? Ring in the new year with less stuff in your home and more money in your pocket with Mercari. That's Mercari, M-E-R-C-A-R-I, Mercari, the selling app. This podcast is also brought to you by Blue Apron. I absolutely love Blue Apron. As a matter of fact, my wife's cooking a Blue Apron in the kitchen as we speak. Here's the question, though. Can healthy be delicious? Blue Apron thinks so. And with their new health-conscious menu featuring a range of ready-to-cook meals made with lean proteins, whole grains, minimal dairy, and flavor-packed produce. The New Year's is looking bright, and we all want to lose weight over the New Year's. Discover balance with the weekly recipes that range from grain bowls to curries to salads to stir-fries. The beginning of a new year is always a great time to reevaluate your lifestyle and your eating habits. Blue Apron believes a healthy lifestyle starts with a balanced relationship with food and knowing exactly what goes into each meal. Because you chop it, grate it, zest it, sear it, season it, and plate it into existence, it's all done from the comfort of your own home. You know what you're putting into your body because you are making it yourself. Create a personalized plan that works for you with Blue Apron's ever-changing mix of plant-forward, vegetarian, carb-conscious, Mediterranean, diabetes-friendly, WW-approved, and 500 calories or less options. Choose from a variety of chef designs, ready-to-cook meals with perfectly portioned ingredients and lots of flavorful options all sent directly to your door. Best of all, Blue Apron helps me disconnect from my phone and connect with my family, discover my inner chef, learn new recipes, new new techniques. I've said this forever. I am closer with my family because of Blue Apron. We've got a thing we do together. So forget looking at food on social media. Connect with your family. I'm actually talking about taking time to plate my meals, put it out on the table for my family, and really enjoy it. And I remember why I love cooking because Blue Apron has exposed me to delicious recipes I wouldn't have thought to try. With Blue Apron, the hard parts are done for me. Cooking isn't a burden anymore. In fact, it's actually fun to learn new kitchen skills with each meal. Blue Apron chef design recipes include amazing specialty sauces, 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 and premium ingredients blends that Otherwise, it would be difficult, expensive, or time-consuming to source or make. So create a healthy mealtime routine that works for you in this 2020. Check out this week's menu and get $60 off when you visit blueapron.com slash BurtCast. That's blueapron.com slash BurtCast. Blue Apron. Feed your soul. So what's it like moving back to Scotland? It's after- awesome. Awesome. It actually wasn't my idea. It was my wife's idea. But you're married, so you understand that yeah. <laughs> she has an idea. That's what we're going to do. I would love to live in Scotland. I think you'd probably enjoy I would it. fucking love to so, live in Scotland. So it's all right. It's pretty easy. Just go. Uh, you know what? I'm tethered. My kids... It, I've, I've well, wanted- we were lucky in that respect because my oldest boy was just going to college and my youngest boy was just young enough to make the move without it being a big deal and he'd be excited about it so that that we took that chance when he's older we'll probably move back here but it's you know that is what it is that's great so did you get to like as a kid i always i was i I just want to correct something sorry 
I don't think we'll move back. <laughs> I don't think we'll move back. <laughs> As a kid, I lived, I grew up in Tampa, and I have fantasies about single engine. I'm going to say Cessna. Yeah. Wait, do you fly? Oh, yeah. Oh, I know what we're talking about next. I just took a flight in a single engine Cessna. What do you think? Uh, I was just talking to Bill Burr about it. He you know, Bill flies a helicopter, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And he's beyond passionate. Mm, but it's I, amazing. I think I have a theory about the type of people who fly mm. are people who can't shut their brain off normally, but flying forces you to. Well, I see, I think flying is a very interesting spiritual axiom. It teaches you how to live. Oh, I'm ready to hear this because well, I, I, I just, we just took a flight from here to Fresno in a small plane. Mm hmm. And the whole whole prereq was I want to learn how to fly. Right. And so the guy said, then sit next to me. We'll get you up. We'll fly a little bit. We'll let you fly a little bit. And I'll show you how it's done. Mm -hmm. It was so overwhelming how At much first. shit you have to know that At I was like, first. I, it was almost like learning a new language. And I was like, yes. I, don't, I don't think I have the bandwidth. Like, I don't know. Yeah, if, you could. Well, it depends. Helicopter is a different thing. I, I, I a helicopter, I don't know how people can do it. You know, if, if you say to a helicopter pilot, next time you talk to Bill, say this to him. Say, ask him if he can juggle. Because even if they can't, if they think about it, they'll go, yeah, I think I probably could. <laughs> yeah, because they're doing Cause they, foot, foot. They can, yeah. they can kind of, I can't juggle. But I, I can, can fly an airplane pretty good. So so tell me about your spiritual connection. with. Well, I, I, first of all, there's the, just the whole idea of flying. You know, taking yeah, a, a machine into the air and, and being in control of it, which is amazing. Oh. But also, it taught me a lot about perspective. See, I, the only reason I got into flying is because I was frightened of flying. I was, I was frightened of flying. Terrified to fly. Right. Terrified. I'm terrified of it too. So I had to learn how to do it. Uh, and actually, it was Kurt Russell that got me in at flying. Because Kurt Russell's huge into flying. And I said to Kurt Russell, I'm terrified of flying. He went, You're not terrified of flying. You're just a control freak, and you just need to learn how to do it. And I'm like, no, no, I'm terrified of flying. Kurt Russell can get me into gay sex. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he 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 won't. But I can see what you're saying. Yeah. I see where you're going. Um, but also, the thing was because I've been flying with him. He asked me to do some. You can't cry in front of Snake Plissken. You understand God. that, right? You gotta you gotta man up when it's Snake Plissken is there. So um, um but I. I started flying. I, I took these lessons because I was terrified of it. When you're in LA, you're working on the, the late, late night late, show. Late. Actually, it was the writer strike. The writer strike in 2000. And, uh, when was it? 2010, 2000, 2008, maybe. I 2008. Know. Yeah, 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 right, yeah. 2008, 2007, something like that. So the writer strike's on. Uh, I, I can't go to work, so I need something to do, and I had just gotten into it then. So I just, I really crushed lessons at that point and did a lot of them i got my license at van nuys airport but i uh when you're flying an airplane you gotta how you feel is not fucking important it's what's happening is fucking important so if you particularly when you're learning to fly by the instruments only mm -hmm. you know if you're looking at the instruments, you got to trust the instruments. If you if you look out the window and you can't see and you feel like you're going this way, there's no fucking guarantee you're going that way. You're just making that shit up. Yeah, that you know? happened to me the whole time. Right. Because And that's what happened to uh, John, F. John yeah. F. Kennedy. He went into a graveyard spiral because, uh, you know, I, I mean, I wouldn't wish that on anybody, but he was... Flying in conditions that he wasn't properly qualified to fly, and he was in. flying on the instruments, and in and he was incorrect, right? Right? Or, or he, we... had he been flying? Look, I don't know enough about that accident, but my understanding of it is, had he flown the instruments properly, that wouldn't have happened. That's right. He was flying by feel, by like going, "We're going fine." Mm. Yeah, and the instrument, and so what I think I liked about flying is also it's completely rational. It's a hundred percent truthful. Like in show business. Is 100% bullshit. 
Yep. Right? You live by bullshit. Oh, hey, I know how to ride a horse. Sure. Right. Give me the part. I'll be fine. Yeah. I don't fucking yeah. know. Uh, I know how to host a late night show. I'm fucking not. You just fucking. <laughs> I just you, left a meeting where I'm like, wait, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah, here? that's it. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I've always loved uh, the Knights of Britain. I don't fucking know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I play poker all the time. I don't fucking know. You just yeah. tell whatever lie you need to tell at the time. <laughs> sure, I can be president. Fucking fine. It's fine. Whatever lie you need to tell. I can act. Time. Yeah, I can act. I'll, I'll be there. Sure, I've been sober for years. You know, whatever it is, you lie to do it. In aviation, if you lie about your abilities, you die that day. That fucking day. Ooh, that's an interesting. So you have to tell the truth about yourself. You have to be honest about what you can do, what experience you have. And how capable you are of moving forward from this point. You got to tell the truth about yourself in aviation or you won't be in any form of aviation. God. And that, I think, is uh, terrifyingly rational. That's insane. Hmm. So how long did you, was it before you took lessons until you started doing it so, by yourself? Uh, I, I, was, I was flying for a, a couple of months before I sold it out. And then it was a while after that before I got my license really um yeah the soloing was not the most difficult thing that's three landings and takeoffs at the airfield that you've been flying at all the time by the time i saw that i was ready to kick the instructor out get out let me do it yeah but flying the first they call it your cross first cross country flight where you fly away from the airport for the first time on your own that's a little that's a moment. <laughs> That's really? a fucking moment. Yeah. I flew from my first cross country. I flew from Van Nuys to Bakersfield. And then what's the name of Porter or something? It's up from Bakersfield. I can't remember the name of the airfield. Porterville. Is that, is that a town? Oh, uh, up? I think it's Porterville. I went to Bakersfield. I landed at Bakersfield. Of course, Bakersfield is a big runway. And there was nobody around. I'm on my own. I make the sweetest landing of my life. Yeah. Just like nobody to see it. And I'm like, Let's squeak it down. It's beautiful. Then I fly That's up. A, to, that was a great sound effect. That's oh, exactly. Pew. And then I go to uh, Port. I think it's Porterville, and I landed there, and it was fine. And I took off again. Then I fly back to Van Nuys Airport. This is about 150 miles round trip. And I was coming back over the San Gabriel's, and I hit a bit of turbulence. And turbulence is always what frightened me. Yeah. You know, so I hit a bit of turbulence coming over the mountains, and I'm on my own. You know. Now, Kurt Russell, I had talked to earlier about flying, and I'd said to him when I want to get into flying, I'd said, I want to know what's on the other side of that fear. And he said the most movie line ever to me, he said, on the other side of that fear is you. Right? That's what he said. It was like in a restaurant. So I'm, in the, I'm in the plane, and I'm bumping around this turbulence, and it's like a movie. And it's really Kurt Russell's voice in my head going, on the other side of that fear is you, is yeah. you, is you. But I was shitting my pants, so I took the plane up, a little higher and the air traffic controller said, what the fuck are you doing? And I'm like, I just want to go up a little bit. I got a little chop. They're like, okay. So they let me go up a little higher. And then I brought the plane back down to Van Nuys airport. Van Nuys airport has, I think the runway is like 7,000 feet long. Uh, one six, right. Uh, and I was coming at the runway. It took me three goals to land. <laughs> I just, I was so freaked out. And of course, everybody can see you there. Yeah. The, the air traffic controller even said to me, uh, how many landings are you going to be doing today? I'm like, all right, all right, come on. And eventually. I Why did you it. have to do so many landings? You just Well, if, you, if a landing <clears throat> isn't right, the correct procedure is to take off and go around and do it again. It's never the wrong decision. It's always the right decision to go and do that. If you don't like the way a plane's coming in to land, fuck all you can do. When the ground's that close. Yeah. So you would take it up, set it up properly, and come back down and do it right. And it took me three goes to get that landing right. But that's always, there's not a pilot in the world that would consider that. And I, I mean, it's funny and it's embarrassing, yeah, yeah, but yeah. it's not shameful. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Always the right. Like if you're ever in an airplane and the pilot decides, yeah, you know what, we're going to go around and go do it again, that's a, the pilot's making the right choice every single time. I've always thought that with, uh, with fl uh, fl pi flights that are delayed. And everyone gets upset, and I go, no, 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 no. I think we're doing the right thing here. Yeah, always. No, yeah. may, whatever needs to be fixed, fix it on the ground before you yes. go up. Yes. So, yeah. did, so did flying get rid of your fear of flying? You know, weirdly enough, no. <laughs> uh, but here's the thing. I, 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 it did in a way. It yeah. did in a way. I mean, look, I, I just took a flight yesterday from London to Los Angeles. So. 11 hour flight i wasn't frightened on the plane i was watching movies and dozing and stuff like 
before I was in a flight, I'd have been like that the whole flight. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's fine. I've gotten there this past October. I flew really aggressively. I flew a lot, mm. and I was my go to has always been drinking on planes. Always. Yeah, it stopped working for me. That I I I used to do that, and then I was just scared and drunk. No. Oh no! If I have a drink, it disappears. No, oh. like I have no fear whatsoever. Gosh, I I. That's an interesting piece of information. Yeah. That you may want to look at that. I know. Well, I, I say I'm very, I there's a lot I'm learning about myself yeah. this this year. Yeah. But one of the things is I'm very ritualistic. I've, I'm a ritual Magical guy. thinking and all that yep. stuff. Yep. Magic underwear, little OCD things. Yeah, all that. a certain way I got to wash my body mm, before yeah, fuck I fly man. and... You know, there's nothing new in any of that shit. You're not the only poor bastard that's fucking <laughs> trapped in that fucking bullshit. It is bullshit. Oh, like the one of the early teachings of Buddha is about getting rid of all that. Really? Like, oh, get rid of all. That I got to get rid of it. It's making me crazy. It is. It's it will making make you me crazy. just let it. Try off. and let it go. I used to have to fucking wear magic underpants on the plane and all that stuff. It's fucking ridiculous. Uh -huh. Now I've read. There's a very good book called the pilot's guide to aeronautical knowledge and it's a book that the faa puts out i mean it's a very concise book about learning how to fly let me, let me tell you something yeah have you got it no i've got every fucking book about fucking flying that you could ever imagine well the 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 Oh, the sore thing? That's he's good, that guy. That's Tom Bunn, right? I've got everything. Very, very good. As soon as you said that, I went, I if you, there's a book on getting rid of a fear of flying. No, no, it's not. The book the book that I'm talking about <laughs> is is about learning to fly. It's not about fear of flying. It's called yeah. The Pilot's Guide to Aeronautical Knowledge. It's a textbook about learning to fly. The FAA put it out. But I've read it cover to cover. There's nothing in that book about what underwear you wear <laughs> or how you wash your body before you get on the plane or not. What it does talk about is your mindset before you fly you know <clears throat> have you you know are you you know are you tired have you set up the self properly have you i can't remember there's an actually an, an acronym for it and i can't remember what it is but the uh excuse me hungry angry lonely tired that kind of thing but it's like for planes um and there's also something that they call it this get their itis they talk about this. It's like how really how important it is to get there. How, how important is it that you get there now? Oh, that's ever. That's JFK right there. Ever. Like we're going to be late for the wedding. All right, you're going to be late for the wedding. Shit happens. Yeah. Or what about if your flight instructor says, "Hey, I'll come with you." Say yes. Always say really? yes. If another pilot offers to sit up up front with you, always say yes. I would anyway. Certainly a pilot who can fly a plane better than me. I'm like, fuck yeah, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Maybe I gotta get my pilot's license. Maybe like I, I was so overwhelmed by the process and, and but what I noticed It is a is, process. It takes oh, time. It the guy said to me, he said, Well, so then let's do this like I'm gonna let's go through my checklist. And I was like, All right. And the checklist get their itis kicked in on me because I, I like so I'm the kind of guy that if uh, if if I unpack a, a desk from IKEA, I already start putting it together without looking at the instructions. Mm -hmm. And I saw the checklist and I was like, "Just it, we're good." In my head, I'm going, "We're good, right?" Like you've already looked. Like, don't do this for me. Let's just go. He's not doing it for you. He's not doing, He's it, not for doing it for me. And you. he did not fuck around. No. There's no grab assery in flying. And I thought we went through the whole checklist. And then we took off and I, I immediately got this fear of like being a claustrophobia of like, I'm not, I can't go anywhere for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then he gave me the controls and I was having such a hard time steering. Like I just barely move it a little bit. I don't yeah. want to move too much. So you see in movies where people are going like that with airplanes. Yeah. Like, like, why does that ever happen in an airplane? That's crazy. And then he goes, Oh, you need to fly the plane. Don't let the plane fly you. And he just grabs the controls and dives. Yeah. And I go, what the fuck? Yeah, but once you know how it works, particularly a Cessna, by the way. Yeah. If you're in a Cessna and the plane goes into a dive, leave it alone and it'll get you out of the dive. Yeah. That plane wants to fly straight and level. If you go, if you've got a Cessna and you're going like that, you leave it alone, it'll go like that. Yeah. You just it just has to go like that before you hit the ground. So, <laughs> you know, you it'll go like that. 
They're, they're amazing airplanes. They're fabulous airplanes. Are you flying in Scotland? Mm -hmm. I have an RV6, which is an experimental plane. It's uh, it's like a little low wing two seater. Really? Mm -hmm. How often do you fly? It's uh, I share the plane with two other guys uh, who are much better pilots than me, and we we'll fly a little bit. But in the winter, it's tough because it's a grass strip and all that kind of stuff. Oh, okay. So. Is it, I would imagine Scotland's beautiful to fly oh, over. Best VFR flying I've ever seen. I bet. Oh, it's gorgeous. Gorgeous. When I, I, I said to Burr one time, I'm sure I was drinking when I said it. I didn't mean anything by it. I said, I'll tell you why I don't trust helicopters. They go, one screw, Bill. One screw. <laughs> one screw comes out, the whole thing goes, shit. <laughs> yesterday, well, I wasn't told him this like two years ago. Yesterday, he goes, yeah, he said so to me that fucks with my head all the time. Everything's one screw, Bert. Everything's one everything screw. Was, yeah. It's one screw for everything. It's <laughs> not just the fucking helicopter. But you, you know, you go through the checklist. Screw. It's yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah the it's checklist all, all for there. flying is fairly it aggressive. Gets, but it gets. It's funny that actually all that ritualistic shit that you're talking about, mm -hmm. washing yourself a certain way and doing all that stuff, that all plays into the checklist. Use that shit for the checklist. You know. We can't take off yet. Why? Because I haven't done the checklist. That's smart. Yeah. You know, and the check, there's checklists for everything. The checklist before you start the plane up, checklist before you taxi, checklist that you get to the end of the runway, checklist before you take off, checklist after you take off, checklist at cruise, checklist when you start to descend. Check, check your, check your, uh, he, there was, uh, the one thing he kept having me do was check my, check my, uh, gauge or my, my so instruments. They, yeah. They agree and with it's each like, other. Yeah. And it's just, are you at the zero thing? And, mm -hmm. And it was, it for it forced me to get out of fear because I was like, you're busy. I'm too busy working. Right. And also, you start to learn what air is. Air's a liquid. It behaves like a liquid, particularly at speed. It's a liquid. Yeah. So, you know, it's a, I always thought the engine is what keeps the plane in the air. No. Airspeed is what keeps the plane in the air, the air going over the wing. As long as the thing's got wings, you got a shot. Yeah. I guess when you think about it that way, I always found myself to be more of a boat guy. Boats are good. Boats are just like sailing boats is just like flying, except everything's much slower. <laughs> it's yeah. like, hey, there's something over there. Well, I'll have a sandwich and then we'll deal with it. And aviation is like, okay, we'll deal with it right now. Then we'll have a sandwich. So when you got to Scotland, when you moved to Scotland, were you like, I mean, this sounds so silly. I just think of like anyone moving anywhere. Did you go like, uh, so what jobs do we have over here? Like, I know I can do stand up. I know I can tour. I know I can do that. But like, should I look into doing like, uh, like doing a TV show over here? Like what? Like I did. I did think about that for a minute. I thought about doing a TV show over there and, it, and it, I even made a pilot for it and it didn't get picked up. And I'm very glad it didn't. I, yeah. and that would have been a huge mistake. Um, so I, um, I thought about it, but I think it was more of a habit. Like, oh, I should find something to do. But, I, you know, I, I have a movie that I'm directing next year, and I, I want to direct this movie. And I, uh, I have a book that I, you know, I've been writing forever that I need to finish and some other stuff I want to do. I think I'm done with performing pretty much. Yeah? Yeah, I think so. I, I don't, I feel like, uh, particularly with this last thing, the Hobo Fabulous thing, I think, yeah, that's it. I'm tie a bow on that and leave it. Uh, I'm doing a game show for uh, ABC. We're going to shoot next week. It's like a big primetime game show. And I'll do that because that's uh, is it's a contained world. It's a game show. You play the game. Yeah. Um, but the idea of doing a show where I have to either interview people on TV or or, or tour around doing stand-up anymore, I, I, I don't see that happening again. Who who when you look back at the late the late show what what was your best interview do you think where you got up and you're like God damn that was fucking good you know by the way this is one of mine right now <laughs> like I'm I don't normally do this good of a job <laughs> <laughs> I think that that I think that it's usually about who you're talking to I, the example I always give is Desmond Tutu you know because. He's Desmond Tutu, you know. Yeah. Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela changed history. Mm -hmm. So 
if I get to talk to him for half an hour on TV, if I don't come away from that changed, I'm a fucking moron. Yeah. You know, and I, and I, I'm many things, but I'm not stupid. Uh, and I listened to him and that kind of changed me. And I, but I, I didn't think I'd done a particularly good job. I was just interested in what this giant intellect had imparted to me. And that, that was, wow. What was, what's that? <laughs> Is that the pool? It's a pool back here. Oh, I see. I missed that from from being in LA. The the sound of the sucky pool thing. Yeah, the pool <laughs> thing. It rubs the lotion on its skin. <laughs> but um, so I think that it was more it was more about um, people that impressed you. Yeah, you know the the next. I never thought I was particularly good at interviewing. I don't think I am particularly good at interviewing. I know how to have conversation with people, but I'm not Barbara Waters. I can't. If I can get you to cry or shit, I don't do that. It's not my job either. No. I'm, by the way, I don't like conflict. Like no, I I really hate it. I, I really don't like conflict. Really hate conflict. I hate when you know whenever I get asked to do shows where everyone's discussing things. I'm like, uh, no, yeah, gonna, no, and that's why I fucking hate the, the social media and all that. I went back on Twitter today. You did for one day because usually it's my tour manager Tomas that does it, and I said, fuck it, I'm an LA. I'll, I'll do with it. And I, I've been doing it most of the day, but I think I'll probably stop <laughs> before I get hurt because it, it's crazy. Well, uh, I, I I don't thrive in that environment. I said to someone last night on stage, I was like, you know, you, you don't, I forget what I, I forget the line I was using, but I was like, you don't understand how different things were. Like it's, it's almost mind blowing that my children will never know just how different things were. Well, like before social media, before social, before phones, like yeah, the, before phones, before yeah. phones were in your hand. Yeah, I mean, I don't even use this as a phone. No. I barely ever call anybody. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I mean, I don't really need technically a phone. I just need like a computer chip in my ear that I can click every now and check my my postings. It'll happen. I'll be the first one to get the computer chip in the ear. I'd love that. Well, good for you, man. I'm I'm going in a different direction. It's. I wish I could. I wish I could. I'm so tethered to it right now. No, well, I understand that. And and I have been at various times. And I am right now because I'm away from home. My wife and kids are in Scotland. Well, my oldest boy is at, at college. So Where's, Is he in the States? Yeah, he's in New York, in college in New York. Did, so do you, are you going to stop and see him? Uh, well, we'll all be back in Scotland for Christmas. So, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'll see him there. It's weird, though. Yeah. What age are your kids? What's that? What age are your kids? 13 and 15. Right, so you're, you're heading into it. When, when the that little peanut I used to fucking change his diaper, and now he's like six foot one and knows more about shit than I do. What the fuck kind of power dynamic is that? You know, I'm having sincere anxiety it, about my daughter's leaving. Yeah, I I can understand it because you love them so much, but it's the you know it's, it's the way of things. It's not. I don't want it to be. No, I don't either. I don't. I got to tell you, I'm not happy with it. But you know, I'm I'm happy, and I trust him. You know, I he's a smart guy. He's much smarter than I was. As he's much smarter than I am now. You know, and and he's doing his thing, and he's good at it. You What's know? he doing? He's studying animation. <gasps> God, I know, and he's really good at it. And uh, it's like it's really it's it's humbling, you know. Uh, and then my youngest boy is only nine. So. Oh, see, that's what I need as a second so he, wife. He he still thinks I'm okay. Start a brand new family. Get rid of this one. I can send those to college if I get a new one. Well, <laughs> you think that, but that's not quite how it played out for me. <laughs> it's not quite how it works. But you know, it is funny when they grow up. It's not it's not comfortable. Did you have a conversation with your your? Oldest about booze and drugs and alcohol? Sure, from the very beginning. From the very beginning. From you the very beginning, we've always talked about it. He's uh, He doesn't seem to be called to it. Yeah, my oldest is so measured in life. You know, like when she'll she'll make one egg for breakfast. Mm. And I'll be like, why wouldn't you make like, put just put two just in case you want more. She's like, I don't. And I was like, well, you never know that. She's like, no, I know that. Yeah, you never know that. But I made four yeah. eggs this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I don't eat eggs anymore. Why not? I'm fucking. I've been vegan for four years. 
You're vegan too? Well, I got to be honest with you. I, I call it Weird Alien because Weird Al Yankovic is a vegan, but he cheats with uh, cheese on pizza sometimes. <laughs> You're going to say meat. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. He has a little cheese, cheese on, on pizza, pizza sometimes. Yeah. And I feel like that's that's the way it is. I'll never eat fucking carcass again. That's never going to happen. But um, Really? But a little bit of cheese. Yeah. I went sometimes. vegan. I went vegan. Uh, we were at an airport like eight in the morning and we're drinking we're on tour we're leaving florida i'm with my buddy dave and and cobra our tour manager at the time you had a tour manager called cobra yeah 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 never tour with anyone named after a snake of any kind I this is a rule him. i've always followed i named him yeah i didn't like his regular name his name was joe i was like i have too many joes in my life I can't <laughs> cobra <laughs> so he um so i said i'm going vegan and they were like you can't go vegan and i go no i'm going vegan I didn't realize vegan's more of a moral choice as opposed to a health choice. I don't know what it was for me. For me, it was a, it just kind of snuck up on me. But uh, I watched a uh, documentary on Netflix. I was like, oh my God. What was the documentary? Forks Over Knives. Have you seen it? Oh, uh, no. I'm afraid to watch it now. Yeah, don't. It, 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 what, because it's not particularly frothy. It's very medical, it's very uh, practical. It, and, the two guys that are the, the leading proponents of it, one is uh, the head of the Mayo Clinic, a uh, heart surgeon. I think he may be retired now. And the other guy was a former head of the FDA. Uh, so they're not you know, hippies in a VW bus. They are they know what they're fucking talking about. So then mm. how, you this is four years ago? About that, yeah. yeah. And how hard was the transition? Were you, eat, were not, you like no, a steak guy before then? Yeah, a little bit, meat and potatoes. But I... I you know, I'm a creature of extremes, so the, an extreme movement is seems like a, an easier one for me to do than a gentle movement. That's why flying was challenging, because I want to go, ah, but you yeah. don't go, ah. But um, no, it, it, the only thing I felt was for about two weeks, I couldn't get fucking warm. Really? And, I was, and it was in California in the middle of a heat wave. And all I was doing, I was doing that thing you're never meant to do with a dog. I was sitting in the car with the windows closed. That was the only time I could get warm. I was like, uh, I was fucking freezing. But the, uh, other than that, nothing. And what happened, because look, I've been a comedian for a long time and I've done stand up for a long time. And, I, and some, you know, I've said a lot of hateful, stupid, objectionable, wrong things in the course of my life. I, but have, I, I have as well. I'm going to join you on that statement. I have as well. Right. Now, but I have never said anything that seems to infuriate people more than saying I'm a fucking vegan. Dude, you, you can attack religion. You can attack, you can attack anything, politics. But once you see the people, I don't eat critters or anything that squirts out of them, they get the pitchforks and they come after you with the flaming torches in a way that you wouldn't fucking believe. People are so quick to share their opinions yeah. on what you should eat when you tell them you're vegan. Do you know what I think is amazing? I got all these, whenever I get it, I talk with somebody goes, where'd you get your protein? I'm talking to some 300 pound alcoholic who's worried about fucking protein. Protein. Like where the what the why the fuck should I care what you think about my where did you get your protein you don't get your protein like shut the fuck up about yeah. my protein I was uh, I was a vegan I chose to be vegan in that Florida airport I got on the plane I had a drink on the plane yeah and uh, sitting next to a guy wearing a Longhorns Texas Longhorns hat right <laughs> and I said she comes around for the service and she goes what would you like for um. Did you start saying you were a vegan right away? No, I said I said very I can't believe I said uh, uh, what are the options? She said, "Well, we have a pasta and we have a, a steak." And I went, uh, "I'm going to go with the pasta." I said, "Is there meat in the pasta?" And she says, uh, "No." I said, "Is there cheese on the pasta?" And she says, "No." I said, "Awesome, I'll go with the pasta." And she goes, "All right." And then the guy says next to me, he "Goes, what are you like a vegetarian or something?" Yeah, I go mad at and, you, right? And then I said, "Actually, I'm." I've been I'm a vegan. A, a vegan. I've been a vegan for 30 minutes. I didn't tell him that. But I go, I'm vegan. And he goes, Yeah. And I go, Yeah. And so Where'd you get your protein? He goes, and so I start eating it. And then he's laughing. And I go, what? And he goes, I was waiting until you took a bite. You know that there's egg and pasta, right? You're no vegan. You're no oh, vegan. And I thought you I thought what like, you. I didn't want to be like, hey, fuck face, I've only been a vegan for about half an hour. Right. It, it's I'm I, I I don't really give a shit. But he was like the way he did that. I thought it was so. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, like, like I people was... get really mad at you. I, I still not quite sure I understand it. 
The, uh, the, I don't know why it, I don't know why people get take it personally. Yeah, it's so odd. You know, it's it's almost like whenever anyone's had a problem with me not drinking, like if I say nah, I don't I don't drink. Whenever I the, it comes out, or I'm fairly public about being yeah. sober. Whenever anyone's had a problem with me about that, it's because they've got a fucking problem. Yeah. Right. And that's what it feels like with the meat thing. Like whenever I say, nah, I don't eat critters or anything that squirts out of them. Anyone who has a, when people have a problem with it, they're like, why are you so fucking agitated about this? This is a choice I made for me. Yeah. Um, but I think it's to preemptively stop you from shaming them about whatever they're eating. Maybe. I find I it know. so cool when people are vegans. I think it's because I tried it and it was, so, it was, it was how really difficult. You go, how long did you do it for? Uh, I think just a couple of weeks. Yeah. Look, the thing is about it as well, it's not like an addiction thing. It's not like yeah. after I had stopped eating meat for a couple of weeks, I thought, I want to try a bit of steak to see how it is. And I got this, my wife made a steak and, and I took a little bit and I went, yeah, it is not for me. I don't, I don't it's not, it's not hitting where it, I want it to hit. And it, it kind of makes me feel gross. But when I took it, I expected to feel the phenomenon of craving. Yeah. It's, it's nice interesting. Like I did it. I've done it a few times. I've, I went, I've gone vegetarian a few times as well. And when I had my first, I, I got to a place like two weeks in, maybe a week, week and a half, two weeks in. And we were going to a steakhouse and I was like, for like with friends and, yeah. and I thought I'm not like, this isn't something I'm married to. Oh. I'll have a steak. I had a steak. This is going to sound so hokey. But I woke up that night very heavy, yeah. And I felt right, like yeah. I felt like I had the spirit of that animal inside me, oh. and I was like, and I was like, I feel like all of a sudden I feel a lot heavier than I felt before. I never felt this heavy, and I was like, eh. But I still now, I mean, I I just then stopped being a vegan. I was like, I guess I'll live with the hell the the souls of the animals I eat. But I, you know, I don't know. It for me it works. You yeah, know? for me it it works, and the the way that you know. Like people will bang on about fucking carbon emissions coming out of perfectly decent automobiles and not want to talk about the real fucking problem of all these fucking cow pastures causing all that fucking deforestation and all the, you know, and the uh, industrial farming methods and the fucking bullshit that that brings to the world. But, you know, I'm a fucking some judgmental hippie for even bringing it up. I, I don't know, man. It just yeah. seems to me there's a lot of selective amnesia about that shit. I'm I'm bothered by the selective amnesia that happens in our country with where people light people up online, usually online for social justice issues, whereas they're not taking a look at the big picture, like say all the plastic in our oceans or they're like, not interested in the big picture. I think anyone like I think the the joy of lighting someone up on social media is exactly that there's no fucking subtext what they're doing is they're enjoying lighting someone up on social media it's what yeah. they used to call the blue bottles the 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 people that would hang around the guillotine waiting for someone to get their fucking head chopped off you know blue bottles blue bottles is what they called them why yeah. blue bottles I don't know, big you know these big heavy flies the they call them blue bottles and yeah. they would hang around the uh oh the, the flies yeah yeah, yeah 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 no but they would call the the people that that would take delight in seeing the murder of other people or uh, uh, the allegorical murder that occurs on social media. But the, but the social media, the problem I have with social media is that all media is now social media. All Twitter is considered a source. That's like, it's ridiculous. That's like the bathroom, the public bathroom wall where a guy wrote something on a sharpie is considered a fucking source it's unfucking believable that you would consider that a source and you know whenever <laughs> it's funny i was talking to my wife about it she said i went on i went on instagram and it just pissed me off and i said baby if you swim in a sewer you shouldn't start complaining if you get hit in the face with a turd it's gonna happen yeah um and i I feel like the problem is that now all media is social media. I don't know where you get your news. I don't know where the fuck I get mine. I just fucking try and pick my way through it. And the the idea that did you ever watch what's that? Is that a plane? It is. It was a jet engine or something. No. It's all right, it'll pass. But the um 
But the uh, the idea that you ever watched when your kids were young, uh, toddlers playing soccer, like the ball goes one yeah, way yeah. and all the kids just go, there's no one's thinking about the game. They just all follow the fucking ball. Yeah. You know, they're like, they're like, ah! That's what I think media is now. Just like, bah! they all go oh. there, bah! they all go there. Bah! And I, I don't know what to do about it. I can't help. I got nothing to fucking say other than express my, you know, despair about it. And I quit. And I think that's it. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll host a game show because it's a good job and it's fun to do. And I like doing it and I'm good at it. I've won two fucking Emmys for it. So I must have been reasonable at it. Yeah. And I like doing it and it's rewarding. But the idea of being involved in the maelstrom of public life, fuck that shit. It's, uh, it, I think it eats at you. I, I know that <clears throat> what happens to me is especially my, my OCD and my, my anxiety really heightens when I have a morning on my phone. Like this morning, I did not have a morning on my phone. I mm. barely have touched my phone today. Do you Google yourself a lot? You look at what people are the, they're, what they're saying about you? No, I'm not. No. By the way, I'll take Googling yourself to an art form, but I do not Google what people are saying about me. I learned that very quickly <laughs> i was like i'd one i won't even read comments anymore because one negative comment i'll oh, i'll scroll oh, through yeah. positive until find ones it. until i find until the negative find one and then i'm like that's what i was looking that's for that's the one you were looking for it's like a lump it's, in your it's testicles a, it's a reverse narcissism i think it's uh venus uh, it's a narcissist despising his reflection yeah that that's that's what it is and and it is uh there's a, there's a very a good speaker who's no longer around anymore. He used to talk about that. He used to talk about the idea of it's really a form of perfectionism. Oh, I'm a hardcore perfectionist. Yeah, that's why, that's why you're looking for the guy that hates you on Twitter. Yeah. That guy hates everybody. Oh, yeah. Sometimes yeah. he's uh, he's 12. And you're like... Do you, ever, do you ever go out, like maybe you're doing a gig somewhere? Or you? I used to think this when I was driving out in the I-40 and you'd pass like some real podunk trailer park somewhere on the side of the freeway and the trucks are going by and it's some people who are really struggling and and putting their you know putting some kind of life together there yeah and i would drive by these things and go that's the comment i'm worried about coming from right there is that some person who's angry about a whole lot of things yeah and you know and i'd say guess what everybody i'm a vegan you know <laughs> why wouldn't you fucking throw a fucking piece of shit at a guy like me for saying that i why get it i just don't want to i just don't want to have it hit me that's all yeah don't don't get mad at me for ducking you know it's just that's just the way it is it's nice to it's it's nice to be off your phone it really is i'm so tethered to mine Lately. It's, it's a real it's a, it's a it's a 21st century problem no doubt it's a real issue and it's a real issue for a lot of people and i i have no helpful information other than the only thing i've learned about fucking doing shit that's making you feel bad about yourself like the best one is maybe smoking the only way i could really stop smoking is to stop putting a cigarette in my mouth and set fire to it other than that, it's all just bullshit conversation. You know what I mean? It's, it's Here's how you stop drinking. Don't fucking drink. <laughs> now, that being said, you're going to have to do stuff or you'll, or you'll fucking kill yourself because yeah. you'll go psychotic. But with smoking, that's different. You stop smoking, eventually you'll start feeling okay. Uh, same thing with uh, losing weight. Yeah, yeah. Weight's if another you, one. If right. you just, like I, I, I got home last night. So I, I lost like 35 pounds in, uh, in a couple, few months. Um, Right around October, beginning of November, and then so I that started, would be the month you don't drink. Don't drink, yeah. Oh, okay, I, I don't know if the two are connected in any way, but I I just thought I might. I'm I'm definitely a lot healthier person. Like I, but but it's what, a fucking poison with a slightly narcotic effect. Well, let's yeah. call it what it is. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's poison with a narcotic effect. Now you can put a fucking label on it. You can f put fizz through it. You can say, "Ooh, it smells a bit like apples." It's a poison <laughs> it's a with poison. a narcotic effect. It is a poison. Oh, so, but I feel I, I when I'm when I'm not drinking, I'm just I, I'm a lot more active. I just get up earlier. I get go to the gym. I like These are all the, terrible side effects yeah. of not drinking. I've noticed all of that myself. But uh, but I've continued the. I remember I. It is it is a weird effect of and it makes sense. But after October, my drinking is cut back drastically for the next 
six months, eight months, and then it starts kicking in when I know October's coming around. Well, yeah, you know, look, I'm going to tell you how you live your life, but if it's getting in yeah. the way. It's not right now, well, but. Man, then fine. Yeah. But know. but what I, uh, in losing weight, someone was like, so how, how did you lose the weight? And it's super simple. It's just eat less, eat less. and move more. Yeah, but you, actually, you could cut it down even more. Just eat less. Just fucking eat less. Just eat less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But last night I got home and I go, I, I'd been out. Uh, some friends are in town. They'd been shooting a movie and they're in town. They're at the bar next door. And so I go over there to have a drink with them. And I, I have one drink. I walk home and I know that I have a bunch of tacos in my fridge. Uh, sweet late night eating. And I, I, I feel the same. I, have, I struggle with it still to this day. There's something really great about oh. fuck it, fries. You know, yeah, come on. I, I just stood in my kitchen and I went, there's no science to this. It's just, Bert, walk into that room, put your head on that pillow and go to bed. Don't eat anything. And I just did it and I woke up feeling great. But then I had a taco the second I woke up. I was oh, like, so yeah. wait, I could have had that taco last night or this morning. I I, I, I don't know about it. I just sleep a little better if I'm hungry, but it's harder to get to sleep. But once I get to sleep, I sleep better. Yeah, but that's I don't know if everybody's like that. I'm I'm like that. But, I sleep pretty. I, but I I eat. I fucking, you know. Also, you have I have one of my kids is still young, so there's like tater tots and stuff around. You know. I mean, oh God. Fuck that sweet kid food that these 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 kids eat like millionaires. <sighs> oh, there's those little fried chunks. Of I remember hearing John Favreau say, "They go, how did you stop eating? How did you lose weight?" And he goes, "I just stopped cleaning out my kids' plates." <laughs> Dude, well, mac and it. cheese was a motherfucker. Oh, yeah. Because you'd make your kids mac and cheese and they'd have a little bowl and then you'd have a big thing of oh, yeah. <coughs> mac and cheese in there. I just murder it every time. Sure. Sure. Oh, man. So, what, how, how, how long are you in the States for? Uh, I'm going to shoot this game show for ABC next week. I'm going home. And then, what are you, where are you staying? Well, here? Yeah. In a hotel. That's nice. You know, it's kind of weird. I got to be honest with you. It's got to be weird. I'm like, well, it's kind of strange. Do you yeah. drive by any old haunts? You know, I, I was driving by today because I lived in LA for 23 years. I was driving today. It was my first day. I got in yesterday. I was and I drove by uh, Carrie Fisher's old house. And Carrie threw a part a birthday party for me in that house. God, ten years ago, maybe something like that more. Um, and it's it's weird. It's a weird feeling. I mean, she's not there anymore, and the house. I don't know what's going on with the house. It belongs to someone else, I guess. And I'm like, I, I don't know. It's fucking strange. The, the world, you know, the world changes. And it's it's weird being back. It's made me feel very strange. Yeah. Like my kids were born here. My my life was here for a long time. For a long time. Yeah. You know, I made my money here. I made my <clears throat> my career here. All your success. I mean, not all, all of it. No, but... all of it. All of it, really. All of it of any meaning is from here. It's crazy because it must have a huge stamp on your spirit to come to a place where you just thrived yeah yeah i did but the la that i knew and you've been here for a while you know it's different here oh it's changed here a lot in the past five years it's changed a lot i think something happened with the traffic is a little weirder Mm -hmm. uh maybe something to do with like the amount of ubers on the road maybe gps things people can go wherever well, i don't know what interesting. it is interesting i bet you see that a lot clearer than i see it because it it's been a it's like uh gaining weight you don't notice you've gained weight but if you haven't seen someone for four years and then yeah. you see them, you're like wow you got fat yeah a little bit you know i mean it, it, la has changed a lot and um the homeless problem is, is it's really upsetting it's i'm really sure it's upsetting. more upsetting for the actual homeless people but it, it's hard to see man it's it's like, oh my god! <laughs> it's a great joke. <laughs> it, it the homeless joke. problem is so bad here. I mean, it makes me feel terrible. I actually feel worse than the homeless people do about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it it's really, it's really hard to know what to say or do about something like that. It feels very, feels very weird in LA. I I, I, I am starting to do uh, little small things where mm -hmm. I or like uh, I got a thing I'm working out with this taco place that i went to mm -hmm. last night they do something so i thought well i can do something too and i have a little yeah I, i've done bits and pieces yeah as and well. so yeah, I, yeah. I, and but i find i have a real issue with uh offering my time for people i don't know why but i do i don't because if i do it 
I don't like being told what to do. So if I do it, I want to do it. I want to do it on my schedule. And I'm, I want, and I don't want to tell anyone about it. Cause if I, once I tell someone about it and they expect it of me, I start going, uh, this feels dirty again. I think that's a fairly healthy spiritual axiom that if you do something good and someone knows about it, yeah. that negates it. You got to find something else to do that's good so that they, no one finds out about it. Then it, then it's good. That, that's how I feel about it. Yeah. I don't, I don't know why I, they, you know, do something good for someone. And if anybody hears about it, you got to find something else to do. Yeah, I agree. When you when you decided to move back to Scotland, did you where did you move to in Scotland? Did you move to where you grew up? Close to it. Not the town I grew up in, but but you know, Scotland's not a huge country, so it's, it's Did you get to like did you get to pick a place to live in that as a kid you were like I would love to live there? Yeah. How cool is that? Yeah, it's pretty cool. We well, were like can't, when you're moving into it, and you're like, I can't believe. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. You know, it's 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 good. I like it. I mean, look, I don't know if I'd have moved back, but but Megan wanted to go, so and I'm I'm really glad we did it. I'm really glad we did it. It's cool. It's also, you know, what I think. Here's what I, here's what I noticed today. I was talking to Megan about it actually on the phone today. You know, when you go on tour, and like you're in a hotel in say Denver or. San Francisco or yeah. Albuquerque or wherever it is. And there's the local magazine is always in the hotel. And it's like, you know, Denver Confidential or, you know, uh, Sacramento Scene or something like that. It's always some free magazine in the hotel room. And you get pictures of local people at the parties. Well, I was in the hotel in LA and uh, there's pictures of all these like movie stars and shit at parties. And I think, this just looks like a fucking dunk fucking time <laughs> it's like it could be fucking anywhere and i think la suffers a great deal from thinking it's a lot cooler than it is and uh, i and i i that's kind of how i begin to feel about the social media thing see twitter in particular that's the only one i was ever on uh it's a chat room right you remember chat rooms it's, yeah. it's just a giant chat room now i think we can all agree that i'm cool you are. I'm cool. Yeah, you are. You have been for a long time. A long time. I'm too cool to be in a fucking chat room. <laughs> I, can't, I, I can't be in a fucking chat room. I'm too cool. I gotta go. I'm like, what? I'm not talking to you. Fuck you. I'm too cool. I can be in your fucking chat room. Yeah. And and LA feels like a little bit like that to me. It's like everyone thinks they're cool. You're not fucking cool. If you were cool, you wouldn't think you were cool. Yeah. No. It's it's the paradox of coolity. Um. And I. I don't know, man. I, I I feel kind of the the alley that I loved. I don't I don't think it's 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 different, and and I'm not part of it. And I don't know if it's better or worse, but I'm not part of it. You know, I'm yeah. I'm out. I feel like I've uh, I've I I fantasize. Everyone in alley does that, and you did it. That's right, but I'm cool. <laughs> that's the perfect way to end this interview that is the perfect way to, you really are craig thank you so much for doing this man Anytime, Bert. i love you i really right back at you love you and too. when i come on tour i'm doing a european tour again amazing i can't wait i'm gonna hit yes you up I'll, come to you. I'll open for you oh <laughs> perfect